thanks to the organizer for putting together this amazing program with all these amazing speakers. And let's just get started. Uh, so typically, we think of evolution of this amazing process with the power to create structures of incredible functionality, for example, multicellular organisms or human language. But at the same time, also tumors are the product of an evolutionary process, of an evolutionary process which often spans multiple decades, the product of selection and mutation. So and I want to present here uh, my view of this process in a cartoon model. As we have heard yesterday, uh, there's a lot of mutation even in normal cells. And when we start looking at this evolutionary process, uh, let's start with the development of a healthy organ with a single cell over here. It will divide and there will be billions of cells and basically every single cell will be genetically unique. Whenever a cell divides multiple mutations across its whole genome are acquired. So depending on your definition of clone or subclone, you could actually say every single cell is its own subclone. And when you let this healthy organ grow and it replicates, then some of these mutations will actually land in cancer driver genes. But very few, most of the mutations will not do any harm. Few of them land in cancer driver genes. And very few of those mutations which are in cancer driver genes are actually gain of function or loss of function mutations. Even that is not yet a problem because very few of those cells will actually then uh, start to replicate and grow into, for example, a precursor lesion even that is not yet a problem because most precursor lesions never actually progress to a primary tumor. So only if you acquire multiple driver gene mutations, functional driver gene mutations sequentially in the same cells, then you can get a primary tumor. More mutations will be acquired over time and then eventually metastasis will be seeded in that process. And only the metastasis, as we have heard this morning, most of the time actually kill the patients and not the primary tumors. So one of the things what I wanted to talk about from this slide also is uh, intertumoral heterogeneity, what we have heard yesterday about. And I think it's very important to distinguish different types of intertumoral heterogeneity. So Bert Vogelstein in his review a couple of years ago, he said it's very important uh, to classify intertumoral heterogeneity into heterogeneity within primary tumors, within the same metastases, or with among different metastases. And the reason for that uh, distinguishing this different primary, uh, this different intratumoral heterogeneity types uh, is because they have very different implications for treatment, but also different implications when you want to understand the mechanism behind those intratumoral heterogeneity. So my re research really focuses on understanding the fundamental mechanism giving rise to that evolutionary process. And how I'm approaching this question is, as many others in that room, uh, I use phylogenomics, so I have a lot of amazing collaborators which generate all this data. And what we do is uh, we take biopsies from different regions of the primary tumor, we take biopsies from precursor lesions, we take biopsies uh, from many different metastases, from normal tissue, and then we reconstruct an evolutionary tree. And also, as we have heard yesterday, so the evolutionary tree is really only the start for the analysis. And what we want to do then afterwards is to create some simple mathematical models to explain whatever we observe over here. So, you know, I have trained with Martin Novak for many years. You can create a lot of mathematical models. The part or the beauty is to create the simplest possible model to explain what the data shows. So before I start uh, going into the different projects, so I want to present one project on cancer initiation and another project related to intermetastatic heterogeneity. I want to acknowledge uh, my collaborators in both of these projects. So this is uh, Tricia Capuzzi O'Donoghue and her postdoc Alvin. So they run a pathology or genomics lab at MSKCC. And Bert Vogelstein, uh, who does a lot of cancer genomics at Hopkins, and then Martin Novak, my postdoc advisor, and Jeff Jorold is a PhD student uh, within this group. So 
typically when people talk about the evolution of pancreatic cancer, most of the time they would go back to this uh, stepwise progression model from Ralph Rubin, which was really proposed already almost 20 years ago. And what they have done to come up with that progression model is they have looked at these precursor lesions in the pan ends, and what they observed was that typically when you see a low-grade pan in the pancreas, then you have mutations in keras, then when you have higher grade panins, then you get additional mutations in CDN K2A, and then eventually you get mutations in TP53 and SMOD4. So basically, when you have a high grade panin, you have the genetic background to develop uh, a primary tumor. However, very few of these high grade panins actually progress to a malignant tumor. So, why is that? So, you can look at the statistics. And in fact, many of us here in this room will have precursor lesion in the panins. But still, the lifetime risk of developing pancreatic cancer, fortunately, is actually quite low. So to address that question, what's the difference between the panins, the benign panins that progress to malignant cancer, to the ones which don't, we did the following study. Uh, so we had a data set of eight patients for which we have uh, surgical specimens of 12 panins and eight matched primary tumor samples. And basically what has happened there in the surgery, they cut out the primary tumor with a large fraction of the pancreas and then sliced the pancreas into small pieces to find spatially distinct panins. So they really were not connected in any way in the tissue. So there was a lot of space in between, so at least uh, one centimeter. And then we did whole exome sequencing on those samples. So then we hypothesized there are multiple different ways how these panins and primary tumors could have evolved. And we tried to classify them into three different scenarios. And the three scenarios were as follows. So principally, the precursor lesions and the primary tumors could evolve completely independently. So there is a distinct evolutionary lineage. They basically do not share any uh, common somatic mutation. So that basically represents is my representation of an evolutionary tree. Uh, and what I mean here with this curly brackets is they could acquire then uh, at least one or a number of driver gene mutations to progress to a panin or progress to a primary tumor. Another scenario is that some of these driver gene mutations are actually shared between the primary tumor and the precursor lesions, but then they acquire different ones once one progresses to a primary tumor, the other one kind of progresses to a panin, an evolutionary dead end, as we also call it. Or there is the third scenario where they acquire all driver gene mutations in common, and basically just based on the driver gene mutations, we cannot distinguish a precursor lesion and a primary tumor, and there must be some other reasons why that did not, or at least did not yet, progress to a primary tumor, well as here we have a primary tumor with billions of cells. So when we started analyzing this data, we used uh, phylogenomic methods to reconstruct these evolutionary trees, and then based on these evolutionary trees, uh, we classified them into the three scenarios. So what we found is that uh, four out of these eight patients actually fell into this category over here. So let's, for example, look into uh, that patient over here, PIN 101. So they, interestingly, they share the KRAS mutation, so they also then acquired 13 additional passenger gene mutations, but then the primary tumor acquired additional mutation in CDK and 2A and TP53 and 26 more passenger gene mutations, which then gave rise to uh, the founding cells of the primary tumor. So in contrast, uh, the panin over here also acquired a mutation in the driver gene, e acquired even more passenger gene mutations, but that one still was a uh, benign precursor lesion. So and basically all other three examples are uh, exactly like that. So the fascinating part of that, uh, of that data or of these results here are that, as you can see, there is a common ancestor, but still the primary tumor and the panins, they don't exist in the same space. So as I said, there was a lot of normal tissue in between. So that means there must be some potential for migration very early on in tumor progression. 
So then we also found two patients for which we think uh, two distinct evolutionary lineages gave rise to the primary tumor and the precursor lesions. Although they actually acquired exactly the same mutation in KRAS, but because this is such a common mutation in KRAS, and because no other additional passenger gene mutations were acquired on the drug, we really think that this mutation was independently acquired twice in two different lineages. So here and here, and interestingly, exactly the same thing happened here and here. And then for the last scenario, which is perhaps uh, the most challenging one, especially now that I'm at the Center for Cancer Early Detection, so we think a lot about tumor progression, how we can identify the lesions which eventually will give rise to a malignant cancer and how can we distinguish them from the lesions which will not progress to a malignant cancer. When we look at these two patients over here, at least from the perspective of driver gene mutations, they have everything in common and they, you really can't distinguish them. So then we thought, well, perhaps if we look at the copy number alterations, since copy number alterations are pretty common uh, in pancreatic cancers, perhaps then we can distinguish them. However, I mean, the primary tumor acquired copy number changes in these important genes. So did the precursor lesions also. So I think uh, these data will kind of be very challenging for everything what's now going on with liquid biopsies, cancer early detection. If we cannot distinguish those, how can we ever come up with uh, reliable detections for small cancers? So the other thing, as I said before, for us often, the inferred evolutionary trees are really the start for doing much more with this data. So we created a mathematical model to estimate the time what it takes from the most common ancestor to progress to the founding cells of the primary tumor and the founding cells uh, of the panins. And so we thought, well, perhaps one takes much longer and the other one takes uh, much less time. However, when we estimated those times, so there are actually many years. So the good news is it takes many years from this common ancestor until we get the founding cells of the primary tumor or the founding cells of the panins. However, interestingly, these times from the most recent common ancestor to the primary tumor and to the panins are very similar with 7.1 years and 4.3 years. And you can see with the confidence interval, uh, they are very similar and there's no significant difference. When we then also account for the time what it takes at least from a si single cell to reach a detectable tumor mass, then we would say there should be 8.1 years for cancer early detection. However, that assumes that we can actually distinguish a cell from a cell which progresses to a primary tumor from a cell which does not. Sorry? The timing? So, so based on the, mutation, the number of mutations what we have over here and based on the uh, cell division time, we basically then infer the timing. You count, you count the number of mutations, uh, you have the mutation rate, you have the cell division time, and then you can calculate. So basically very similar in uh, like from a paper from Nico Bernwinkel, I think in 2008 or another paper from Chrissy Cabuthio, 2010. It's a very similar model based on that uh, with some, in some way we pool the data from all eight patients, what we haven't done before, but otherwise it's identical. Sorry? I have such a hard time understanding your calibrations. No, no. So the mutations rate and the cell division time is based on what has been measured before in other papers. So it's not, nothing what we infer from here. Okay. Any more questions to that last study before I kind of switch gears to the next one? Yes. Uh, you're asking the same question as our reviewers. Uh, 
we actually did mutational signature analysis even before we submitted that paper and then we didn't present it because it just didn't really make sense to us. I mean, with whole exome sequencing, you observe so few mutations and then classifying in them into the different mutation signature, you really don't have much power to infer much, right? Uh, we did it then anyway. I mean, some of the signatures what we observe on the trunk are basically exactly what you observe related to cell division and aging. Others are completely distinct. I don't know if that is just an artifact on how mutational signatures are created and you assign them to the different distributions or if that is really what's going on. I think to better study the question of mutational signatures in cancer initiation, uh, one should really do whole genome sequencing. Okay, so now to a completely different topic, uh, and that is intermetastatic uh, driver gene heterogeneity. So that is something what I have been thinking about for quite some time. And this whole project actually started with the reanalysis because we wanted to really see the evidence for driver gene heterogeneity among metastases, but when they are untreated. And as it turns out, there are very few people who have generated uh, whole genome sequencing or whole exome sequencing data for at least two untreated metastases in the, in the same patient. So again, I tried to start with a cartoon model such to communicate basically how I'm thinking about this problem. Let's imagine we have a primary tumor and there is a dominant clone over here and the dominant clone with the same driver gene mutation. So basically you could think all the green cells have the same phenotype they give rise to all detectable metastases. So basically, uh, we observe homogeneous metastases. So then there could be a different scenario where there is uh, an additional subclone over here which actually expanded and let's say uh, has a highly selective growth advantage. And then this subclone gives rise to all detectable metastases. Again, what we would observe is homogeneous metastases. And then there is of course a third scenario where Again, there are multiple subclones in a primary tumor, but then all uh, these multiple subclones also give independently rise to detectable metastasis. And in that scenario, we would have uh, driver gene heterogeneity among different metastases. So why do I distinguish between these scenarios? Because these different scenarios have very different implications for cancer treatment and how you pick your uh, drug, for example. If it's like that, typically, then you would think a single biopsy from anywhere of here would be sufficient to select your drug or select your treatment. If this is the typical scenario, then probably a biopsy of the primary tumor would not be ideal. Better would be if you have a biopsy from a metastasis and then based on that, uh, you decide what you should do. However, if the scenario is like that, then it's actually very challenging because then you would need multi-region sequencing and you should probably also sequence metastasis and you still don't know what exactly is going on. So how do we distinguish between these different scenarios? We do exactly the same thing as I described before. We reconstruct evolutionary trees and then based on these trees, we can assign those trees to the different progression scenarios. So for example, if we reconstruct an evolutionary tree based on these biopsies over here, then what we would find is that driver gene mutations on the trunk would be shared. Perhaps there are additional ones even in the primary tumor for the metastasis, for intermetastatic heterogeneity. We don't really care what's going on in the primary tumor. That one would be classified as the dominant clone sees all detectable metastasis. The same thing basically we can do for scenario two. And for scenario three, what we would observe is, you know, there are some driver gene mutations which are heterogeneous among all the observed metastases, and hence we get intermetastatic heterogeneity between meds. So to start addressing that question, as I said before, in fact, there are very few patients for which have the appropriate data to even ask that question. So we have looked into the literature and we could only come up uh, with 20 patients, in fact, 21 patients, but one didn't have the data, what we needed. So we had, 20 patients for which we could ask the question. So these 20 patients had at least two sequence metastases, either whole exome or whole genome sequencing, where we can ask this question. 
So what we have done first is we assigned all the mutations what we observed, so we reconstructed evolutionary trees and then we assigned all the mutations either are they truncal or are they branched. So that is basically what the pie chart shows over here and here I summarized that. So on average 60% of the non-synonymous mutations were truncal what we observed. And then we uh, looked into the driver genes where they typically occurred, were they on the trunk or were they branched. So as you can see here, if you look through these 20 patients, many more driver gene mutations actually occurred on the trunk than on the branches, but still there are a lot of patients, 13 out of 20, where we observed branch driver gene mutations. However, that is already interesting when you make the comparison and you calculate the ratio of the number of driver gene mutations what you observe in each category normalized by the number of non-synonymous mutations what you observe in each category. So you observe that the driver gene mutation rate on the branches of the trees is less than half than what you observe on the trunks. And perhaps that is to some extent expected from the clonal evolution model, how we expect cancers to progress because there should be a selection for cancer driver gene mutations, perhaps not the same selective pressure as we would expect of branches. So let me show you two examples how that worked. So this is uh, one of the evolutionary trees from our study last year. So what you typically find in all those examples, you see driver gene mutations on the trunk, like ATM and KRAS in this case, and then KMT to B on a branch. And then we reanalyze data from this study. What you see is two independent or two different mutations in APC and TB53, and then many more mutations which were branched in the primary tumor or branched among the different metastases. So when we started looking at these trees, you know, I'm not a biologist or a geneticist, but one thing what became quite obvious was that, you know, the genes for which I have some idea what's, what they mean and what they do, they always are on the trunk, well as the genes what I have never heard about, they are always on the branch. So we did the following analysis. So what is if we use a different driver gene list, what happens? So we used the driver gene list from a very recent paper. Uh, they published the TCJ final consensus driver list. I think they had 299 driver genes. And we compared it with the case uh, where we used the driver gene list from DOC from Toka Metal, uh, from Rachel Karchin's lab, so they inferred a list of uh, 400 driver genes. And what you can see in these different evolutionary trees, basically nothing changes on the trunk, however there a lot of changes are on the branches. So how sure can we be about this heterogeneous driver gene mutations if we just switch a driver gene list and many of the things actually change? Also interesting is a recent paper from Maurice Gerstrom from Peacock last year. They also observed that, you know, there is a lot of driver gene mutations that are acquired on the trunk actually uh, on just 12 different genes. So these are probably the ones that we recall. But a lot of the stuff what is going on in the branches, so driver set of driver genes involved in late tumor progression is actually very diverse. And exactly the same thing we see here and in many other examples. Exactly, yeah. Uh, with the method we use, we don't really, can't, we can't really do that. I mean, we, we call them the, just artifacts, even if that would happen. Exactly. Yes. So, uh, once we observe that, we really ask us, so is there a, a fundamental difference between the mutations what we observe on the trunk and the mutations what we observe on the branch? And, you know, yesterday we had this introduction to cancer biology and it was really perfect for this talk because this is exactly what we realized also. That when you look at driver gene mutations, actually very few of them typically are functional, especially uh, when you look in oncogenes, so this is uh, a figure from, again, from Bert Fogelstein's review. When you look at these two oncogenes, the actual driver gene mutations you would think are recurrent, and they 
all of them basically happen exactly in the same place. And whatever happens outside perhaps has at least not the same functional consequences as the ones which happened, you know, 30 times in different patients. And if you look at then at tumor suppressor genes, whereas here we only observe missense mutations, what you observe in tumor suppressor genes, you should observe frame shift mutations, nonsense mutations, basically those which break the function of a gene. So we did exactly those analyses and we looked at what's the difference between the mutations what we observe on the trunk in driver genes and those mutations what we also observe in driver genes but are branched. And then we asked, so how often are these mutations in cosmic present or not? And what we see is there is uh, almost 40% of the ones which are on the trunk of these uh, patients in driver genes, they are with a probability or with a frequency of 40% in cosmic, however the ones which are heterogeneous, the ones which are branched, actually have basically the same frequency as passenger gene mutations. Then we also ask not just if they are present or not in cosmic, we ask how often are they present in cosmic and we normalize that to the number of samples what they have in cosmic and then what we basically saw is on average a driver gene mutation that is truncal we see in 80 other patients in cosmic, well as when we look at driver gene mutations that are branched and then ask how often they occur in cosmic, it's like zero point something. And again, there's no difference to based on the gene mutations, truncal or branched. Uh, so that basically should resemble the analysis for oncogenes. Then we look at you know, what we observe for tumor suppressor or what we would expect for tumor suppressor genes is there should be an enrichment of nonsense mutations or frame shift mutation. That is basically exactly what uh, VEP does for high impact mutations. And again, you see there is this huge enrichment of uh, high impact mutations in driver genes that are truncal. Well, as when you look at branch driver gene mutations, there's no difference to what you observe in patient gene mutations. So basically, that was then the start of our study Let's create a mathematical model. What is going on here? And what we did is, as usual, uh, we model cancer evolution at the branching process. You have done that many, many times, and the model what we used here is, in fact, very similar to many other people's model. So basically, also similar to uh, the model what I have used in for triomics to benchmark it. Is the difference now here we are not interested in passenger gene mutations, we are really interested in driver gene mutations, so we have to model selection. And how are we doing that? Is we basically simulate, simulate cancer progression starting from a single cell. So the single cell can divide with a probability of B and then multiply that with 1 minus U, the no driver gene mutation will be acquired. It can die with a death rate of D with the probability of U, an additional driver gene mutation is acquired. And then there is also some probability that it dis disseminates to a new site and then gives rise to a metastasis. At the new site, basically, uh, at least for the first analysis, we assume it still divides with a division rate of B and it still dies with a death rate of D. And this uh, beneficial phenotype, it then grows with a birth rate of B plus S, which is the selective coefficient over here. When you start simulating that process, you quickly see what might be going on over here. So the primary tumor starts growing from a single cell. It starts seeding metastasis uh, pretty quickly, and the metastasis grow up and become detectable, whereas the metastasis seeded from subclones, driver subclones over here, they only start to appear much later. And the reason is you have to wait for the driver gene mutation accumulation. So there is a waiting time until you uh, basically acquire this beneficial phenotype. And although they grow much faster, they have a much higher survival probability, still they cannot catch up what the primary tumor already started seeding metastasis much early on. So to explore that a little bit in greater detail, so we did the following analysis to determine uh, the underlying reasons giving rise to intermetastatic heterogeneity or intermetastatic uh, homogeneity. So we explored the following parameter values. 
So we assume different uh, selective growth advantages over here on the x-axis, and then we assumed uh, different growth rates or birth rates. So the, we fixed the death rate at 0.2475, and then assuming different birth rates would give rise to different growth rates, and then we see which parameter combinations would give to heterogeneous metastasis and which uh, parameter combinations would give rise to homogeneous metastasis. And what we see over here is that in a narrow range of parameter values, you can actually get intermetastatic heterogeneity. And the fascinating thing is when you look at it at more detail, the three different regions completely resemble with what I started the talk, with the three different scenarios how you can get intermetastatic heterogeneity. So either the dominant clone in the primary tumor sees all metastasis, which is resembled by that parameter region over here, or there are different subclones in the primary tumor which all can see metastasis, then you get intermetastatic heterogeneity, what we observe in that parameter region, or you can also see that, you see the probability for observing intermetastatic heterogeneity actually decreases again over here. If the primary tumor grows very slowly, then what you can observe is a single subclone with a highly advantageous driver team mutation is acquired, and that one then gives rise to all metastases, and again, you have homogeneous metastases. Uh, and with that, I already want to conclude my talk. Uh, I want to thank, again, to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to, to present the work. I want to thank uh, my collaborators and mentors and my funding. Thank you very much.